Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through verse number 26. And the King James text today reads as follows. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same will save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come, listen, in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Amen. That's Luke 9, 23 through 26. If you'll go to the Lord with me one more time right now for a word of prayer. Father, once again, God, we thank you, Lord, for this time in the house of God. It is a new year. We are beginning afresh. It is a new start. Most of us, Lord, see this day as an opportunity to make new choices, better choices, better decisions. To start doing things as we know we ought to do them. And Master, I pray that in the year to come, this ministry would find its place. After 30 years of struggle, after 30 years of faithfulness to the Word of God, to the work of God, I pray, Lord, that this might be the season of harvest and that we might see a mighty, mighty revival strike this ministry, strike this work, help us to bring souls in. I pray, oh God, that we might see souls saved by the hundreds Men and women, boys and girls filled with the Holy Ghost and power. Broken bodies, ill bodies, sickness ridden bodies, healed and delivered by the power of God and those bound by oppression, those bound today, O oh God, by addiction. I pray that this would be the year that we would see that spirit of addiction brought to its knees. And the child of God set free. Oh, Master, we have such a great work ahead of us. You've called us not to build the church in terms of numbers. You said go into all the world and preach the gospel. But, Lord, you did not tell us to take count and to be numbers keepers. You called us to preach the word. You called men of God, women of God, those who stand in the sacred desk you've called us as you spoke to Timothy you've called us Lord to preach the word to be instant in season out of season Lord you've called us today to exhort to rebuke with all of suffering and doctrine master the word of God the preaching of the word of God is such an important calling it's such an important task and any individual who would stand in the pulpit and think for one moment that they are capable of delivering a word from heaven without the anointing of the Holy Ghost is on a fool's errand, and I'm no fool. Anoint today your messenger. Help me, O oh God, to deliver the word that you placed in my heart for the church of the living God at this dark and dismal hour in the history of your church as the bride is to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Master, help me. Help me. Anoint me. Anoint the ear of every hearer. Every hearer. Let their heart, their mind, their spirit today be conditioned 
by the Holy Ghost to receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, sacred, saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Now, before I get into this message today, I just want to make something clear to you. This message is going to serve a dual purpose, okay? In many aspects, it is a teaching rather than a sermon. I'm using our primary text today in two different ways to accomplish two different tasks. I'm going to address what is stated in the primary text, but then I also am going to use our primary text as an example and as an illustration of a greater important truth that all of God's people, those of us who believe the one God Jesus name message, need to understand what this preacher is about to preach today. So I'm using my primary text in two different ways. I don't want you to think when I get into the second way that I'm just going off on a tangent and losing my place. No, 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 no. I'm going there purposely, okay? As a matter of fact, it's that second point that I wish to make today that is actually... Um, where I get my title today from, Context Matters. Amen. We are taught early, very early on in our schooling, that with the English language it is often necessary to evaluate the context of a statement or of a sentence to understand what certain words in that sentence might mean. The reason being, there are words in the English language which can mean more than one thing, even mm -hmm. though they are spelled identically. Mm -hmm. Okay? And therefore, we read a, a certain sentence and if we're to understand that sentence, or if we're to understand that statement, then we have to look at the context of the whole, and then look at that word again and say, which of the ways this word can be said, and therefore can be meant, applies to this particular statement. For instance, if I were to say to you today, in high school, I took drama, and in my drama class, my teacher taught us how to project our voices. P-R-O-J-E-C-T, how to project our voices. Now, I'm using the words right. That is the word project. But it's also the word project. Do you project your voice or do you project your voice? Do you follow what I'm saying? You project your voice. You can't project your voice. That makes no sense. It doesn't fit within the context of the sentence. Context matters. You've got to look at the context in order to understand that one simple word. Because one word can have more than one meaning. There are many examples today. Uh, homonyms are words which sound alike and they're spelled alike, but they have different meanings. In a strict sense, a homonym is a word that both sounds and is spelled the same as another word. Think of the word, for instance, lie, which can mean not true, or it can mean horizontal or resting position. Amen. Mm -hmm. There are any numbers, any number of hominins. Bat, when used as a noun, a bat could be a winged nocturnal animal or a piece of sporting equipment used in baseball. 
but it can also be used as a verb when a player goes up to bat during a baseball game. Compact, when used as an adjective, compact means small. But when used as a verb, it means to make something smaller. It can also be used as a noun when talking about a small case for makeup. Desert, as a noun, desert is a dry, barren area of land where little rain occurs. When used as a verb, the word desert means to abandon a person or a cause. Fair. The word fair has a few meanings when used as different parts of speech. When used as an adjective, it can describe someone as agreeable, meaning, ah, oh, he's a fair guy. But it can also describe someone who has light skin or light hair. They're fair-skinned. As a noun, a fair is typically a local event that celebrates a certain person, a place, or historical moment. There are all kinds of words in the English language which you read them and they read one way, but it can have any number of meanings. Mm -hmm. And the only way to genuinely understand what it means is to look at the context of the sentence. And that helps then to bring it together so you understand whether it's being used as a noun, whether it's being used as a verb, so on and so forth. And helps us to know which way it is to be understood. Lead, project, lead, lead, project, project, minute, minute, refuse, refuse, second, Wait a second, or he came in second. You follow? Mm -hmm. Fine. Paid a fine, or he did fine on the test. Entrance. They made their entrance, or you come in through the entrance. Clip. Clip the bird's wings, or put a clip in her hair. Overlook. They viewed the canyon from the overlook, or you can overlook one's faults. Consult. You may consult with an attorney, or I tried to consult him in the way of God's Word. Row. I usually sit in the first row, or Michael, row your boat ashore. Discount. I got a discount at the store, or he tried to discount what I was saying. Wind. The wind was blowing, or wind the clock daily. Contract. We signed the contract, or he did not contract the disease while traveling. Object. He had a foreign object lodged in his throat, or the attorney tried to object to the motion. You see? Sometimes in relation to translation, one small word can have a major impact upon the perceived meaning of a text. The Word of God is as important a document as you will ever set before you and read. It's imperative that God's people understand the principle that I am about to share with you as it can greatly affect how we read and understand many passages which speak directly to the nature and identity of our God as He is revealed in the person of the man Jesus Christ. Context should reveal which definition a word should have. But preconceived ideas can contribute to one's embracing one meaning over another. Our primary text today is just such a passage. When you read our primary text today, and I've had many people come at me over the years because they don't understand oneness theology. They don't understand the concept of God being one because after all, there are any number of occasions in the Word of God where the Father and the Son and the Holy 
Ghost are spoken of. And that one little word and implies in addition this one and in addition that one. In our primary text it is no different. At the end of our primary text today, the Lord said, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come, listen, in his own glory and in his Father's glory and of the holy angels. Oh, I see. So Jesus is coming in multiple glory. He's coming in His own glory. He's coming in the glory of the Father, and He's coming in the glory of the angels. Oh, okay, that's what this passage says. No, it doesn't. And I'll tell you why it doesn't say that. Because that contradicts the Word of God as a whole. You remember I've told us how many times, how many times this pastor has reminded God's people that the Word of God admonishes us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. How many times have I reminded us uh, Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. God literally presents the truth in such a manner so as to only permit, listen to me children, the sincere. Oh my Lord. God presents His truth in such a way that the only way you're going to see it, the only way you're going to find it, is number one, you must be sincere. You have to be sincere in your search. You have to be sincere in your study. But secondly, you can only find it with His help and His guidance and His leadership because it is presented to us in the form of a 10 million piece puzzle, so to speak. And you have to compare what is said here to what is said elsewhere and you have to strike a balance so that when it's all said and done, what that statement says to you does not contradict anywhere else or anything else the Word of God says. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Mm -hmm. I told you this is as much a teaching as it is a sermon. With that in mind, in keeping with the mandate of God's Word from 2 Timothy 2.15, the study to show thyself approved unto God, we can better understand what our primary passage today is saying, and see where the word chi, which is translated as and in English, the Greek word that is translated twice in verse number 26, Luke chapter 9, the Greek word that is twice translated and when he shall come in his own glory, and, which is Kai, in his father's, and of the holy angels. The Greek word Kai is a word that can actually be translated in more than one way. And this particular word has two definitions. It is translated in the word of God, uh, both ways. The King James translators use both ways at different times. The only problem is the only thing that determined which way they translated it was the prejudice and the theological understanding that they came into translating with. And because they come into the translation process with the Trinitarian mindset, 
they automatically in any number of places immediately reverted to and, and, and. And over and over again we had passages of scripture which implied that God the Father is one entity or one person as it were and the Son and the Holy Ghost are separate persons or separate entities. But, proper understanding of any passage from God's Word requires that we balance the text against the rest of the Lord's sacred text. I'll tell you, anybody can twist Scripture, anybody can turn it around, make it say what they want it to say. Say, really? Is that something you think that people do? Well, let me tell you, Satan did it in the wilderness with Jesus. If you remember, when Satan tempted the Lord in the wilderness, where the Lord had been fasting for 40 days, every temptation that Satan offered the Lord began with a biblical quote. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Listen, for it is written, Oh, the devil is quoting scripture. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. So he's saying, in other words, it's also written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil take them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said, saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. He did not use scripture in every temptation, but he did in the one concerning cast yourself. The word of God can be taken out of context. It can be twisted, contorted, perverted, and misrepresented. In an effort to make it say just about anything that carnal human beings want to make it appear to say. It is imperative that we be diligent in our studies so as to properly balance the message of the whole and not create a confusing and contradictory uh, bundle of messages consisting of statements which do not and cannot be reconciled one with the other. With this in mind, let us look at yet some other passages which will help us to understand today's passage. In Isaiah 42 and verse 8, Jehovah God declares, the Father, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. And my glory I will not give to another. But Jesus said, He is going to come in the glory, in His own glory, and 
and in the glory of the Father. Uh-uh. No, 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 Jesus. If you're a separate person, if you're a separate entity, if you're separate from God the Father, if you're anything less than God the Father in human form, then guess what? What you just said is blasphemy. Because God has declared He will give His glory to no other. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 48 and verse 11, For mine own sake, even for mine own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. So what God is saying here is, He says, if I expect to receive the glory for something that is done, I do it myself. I don't send someone else to do something and then claim the glory. No. I don't do that. He said for my own sake, I will do it. Because I don't give my glory to any other. If Oh, hallelujah. If Jesus is different than God the Father, if He's a separate, distinct person from God the Father, then the Word of God is a lie. Because God someone else to be the Savior and therefore the Savior is to receive the glory for providing salvation not God the Father because God the Father says I don't claim credit for that which I have not done myself neither neither do I give my credit to someone else that's why I do it myself Hallelujah! Mm -hmm. pretty simple isn't it but do you see where all of a sudden Jesus say, coming in the glory, uh, in my own glory, and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels? Do you see where all of a sudden that passage, if you read it in context and you understand it in a biblical context, it doesn't quite read right when you read and in the glory of the Father, and in the glory of, uh, and in the uh, glory of the angels. Now listen, the word chi, as it is used in the Greek, can be defined in one of two ways. It can either be translated as and, A-N-D, or it may be translated as even, E-V-E-N. Even, when you, word, when you use the word even, it implies similarity or the same. It speaks of the sameness of something. Right. Whereas and seems to imply in addition, okay? Mm -hmm. So you get very different understandings when, when you read in the King James and versus even. And yet the word chi is translated even in a number of places in the New Testament. In Romans 15 and 6, Paul writes that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, he writes, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Now how many times have you read uh, a statement like this might say, When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God and the Father. How many times do you read those words? I'm going to get there in a minute. Many times. But yet in this instance, the King James translators translated it as even rather than and. And the only thing that would determine which direction you go is their personal preference. There's nothing about the language that would indicate you should use even here rather than and. No. So it's strictly at the discretion of the translator. 
So the translators often use the word even. In James chapter 3 verse 9, Therefore bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men. You see, so the term is often translated as even. In John chapter 8, listen to this. In John chapter 8 verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your Father. Then said they to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Now the term even is insert, inserted here by translators to clarify meaning. They don't, they don't use the word here, and. They don't say, uh, uh, we have one Father and God. But they say we have one Father, even God. So they decided, yeah, in this instance, I think even would work better. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, there are instances where even is used, but and could have worked just as well. In Acts chapter 2, verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Even is inserted by translators to clarify meaning. But Kai is not even used, listen to me, in the original text. In the original text, see, what a lot of people don't understand is when you translate from another language, oftentimes, there, you know, I, I had an aunt years ago who was Italian. She married my Uncle Eddie, and this lady, her, her English was very heavily uh, influenced by an Italian accent, you know. And sometimes she'd be saying something, she'd be like, how, how do you say this in English? How do you say this in English? And she would struggle with how to say it in English. She said, because there's really no English word that really fully expresses what this Italian word means, what this Italian word is saying. So, you can find a word that comes close. You can find a word that's almost sort of, sort of, kind of similar. It shares some nuance, you know, of meaning that's similar to the original language. But then also, language structure and the structure of the language oftentimes is such that the original text doesn't even contain a number of words. And so, therefore, the translators, in an effort to clarify the meaning of the sentence for the English reader, they have to insert certain... Now, they're not inserting words that change the meaning of the, the text, but they're inserting words to make a read with better flow. For instance, in this passage, in the original Hebrew... Uh, excuse me, in the original Greek, it basically says... Uh, it basically says, let me read it to you again. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In the original text it basically says, for the promises unto you, your children, all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's how the Greek reads, okay? There is no and. There is no. There's nothing to imply and to you know in addition or whatever. So they they insert these words simply to clarify the meaning. Okay, they're not doing any damage in translation. No, that is part of what translators do. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the word kai, they often are translating it strictly at their own discretion as to whether they go with and or whether they go with even. Okay? In Acts 4 and 10, Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now if they had said, Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by him, this man stand here before you whole. It would have worked just as well. Am I right? 
They could have said, and by him this man stands here. You see? But they said, even by him. Well, but wait a minute. When you say, even by him, it says, whom God raised from the dead, even by him. Now you're pointing back to the subject, God. Do you follow what I'm saying? When you use the word even, you're pointing back to the subject. So in this instance, they used even to point back to the subject rather than simply to make it appear, okay, you got this statement, then you have this statement in addition to the other statement. Okay? Now, I'll try and try to move quickly today. I know I took a lot of time at the start of the service. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Again, it wouldn't have killed the translation if they had said, Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, and so we also should walk in newness of life. Do you see what I'm saying? And in place of even wouldn't have destroyed the translation. But it would have changed, obviously, how it read. It would have been, this is an additional statement, rather than this is kind of a continuation of the statement that we're already making. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, I'm about to read to you any number of passages where this would have been translated, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God and our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. They often use that, God and our Father. Okay, watch. I'm going to show you right now. 2 Corinthians 11.31 The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Galatians 1 and 4 Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Now, what is this passage talking about? Is this passage saying according to the will of God and then our Father is a separate person, is a separate entity? No. So why did they even use the word and? Why wouldn't they have said of God even our Father? Do you follow what I'm saying? There are any number of instances where they easily could have used even in place of and, and it actually would have been better. It would have made more sense because God and the Father are not separate entities, separate persons. In Ephesians 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.20 Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Philippians 4.20 Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Now Trinitarians read this all day and all night and they understand God and our Father, God and the Father are one, that they're speaking of one. But it's all about that one little word, kai, K-A-I in the Greek. One little word translated as and or even. Many of these instances, even would have made more sense. It would have worked better. Now unto God, even our Father, be glory forever and ever. Uh, Colossians 1 and 3, we give thanks to God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now... Colossians 2 and 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. So twice we see the word and used here. What if that were to read the mystery of God, even the Father, even of Christ? Christ. Aha! Now we have the oneness, don't we? Mm -hmm. My goodness.
Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Do you see what I'm saying? Why couldn't that say? Why doesn't that say? Giving thanks unto God, even the Father by Him. Would have flowed better, would have made more sense. James 1.27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Again, why doesn't that read? Giving uh, pure religion and undefiled before God, even the Father, is this. 1 Peter 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 and 6. And uh, that was Revelation 1 and 3. This is Revelation 1 and 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Why couldn't it say, giving, uh, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, even his Father? Now, Revelation, uh, excuse me, there are instances where the word is translated uh, both ways, both and, and as even, in the same sentence. 2 Corinthians 1 and 3 states, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Okay? Same word, kind, but it's translated both ways in the same sentence. Second Thessalonians 2.16 And by the way, just so you know how your pastor works when I teach, I went through every single one of these passages every single one and looked at the original Greek text to make absolutely certain that the word being translated and was indeed Kai. I wanted to make sure there weren't any uh, you know, surprises or any other words that might be translated in this fashion. There is another word in the uh, Greek which also is able to be translated as both and and even as well. Uh, te. But anyway, we won't go there. That one is not used nearly as much, okay? This one is primarily used. So, I went through every single passage and verified. Not a single one of these did I not look up. Alright? So then we come down to... Uh, 1 Peter 1 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Blessed be the God and Father. Oh, I think I misplaced that one. Sorry. Then we go back to Revelation chapter uh, one uh, verse 6 and hath made us kings and priests remember I, I mentioned this earlier unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen they translated it twice as and and yet that easily could have been even could have easily been and made us kings and priests unto God, even his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. That would have made perfect sense, okay? Now, oh, I'm sorry, you know what? I went backwards in my notes. No wonder, I was wondering why stuff was repeating. Oh, the preacher's getting old, folks. Pray for me. Instances were both and, and, even were translated in the same sentence. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself in God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Here we see the same identical word translated as either and or even. Now, there are instances in Scripture where we bump into the word chi, 
and it is translated as and, and immediately it implies something that is in contradiction to the oneness of God, right? What's the number one passage people will come at the preacher with? What's the number one passage they come against the Jesus name baptism message with? Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now that's Kai. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Well, now if you come into this understanding that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, they're not three people, they're one singular God, but they're three manifestations of the one singular God, then you might read this, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, even the Son, even the Holy Ghost. Well, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. You know why? Because the writer said, in the name, singular. He didn't say, in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. No. The writer said, in the name Oh my goodness. So there's one name. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. There is one name that applies to the Father. Jesus, Jehovah, our Savior. There is one name that applies to the Son. Jesus, Jehovah, our Savior. There is one name that applies to the Holy Ghost. Jesus, Jehovah, our Savior. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is Jesus. Hmm. Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Holy Ghost is Jesus. So there is one name. And anybody with the revelation of the oneness of God understands that, that Matthew 28, 19 doesn't even contradict our doctrine. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When the apostles went out, and they began to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. It's because they understood there was one name that applied to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And that name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And like Peter said in Pentecost, there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Yes. To them the word of the Lord declares to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even as many as who did what as believed on his name the word of God declares as many oh, hallelujah and whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved hallelujah the Word of God declares that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, the name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Whosoever calleth upon the name of an eagle. Woo! Glory! Folks, this ain't rocket science! But context matters. Yes, it does. It matters. Better be careful, translator, that one little tiny word can be translated two very different ways. It implies something very different depending on which use you use. In 1 Timothy 1 and 2, listen. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when you read that, immediately you're seeing two people. Mm -hmm. You're saying, well, why would Paul say that grace and peace be from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, if God is one, if Jesus is the Father? Well, obviously the Old Testament prophet was a moron. <laughs> 
And he didn't get it. He didn't understand who Jesus was to be. Because he turned around and declared, For unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Jesus must have been drunk or stupid when he said to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Henceforth ye have seen him and have known him. John must have been bombed up in heaven when he was receiving the final revelation of Jesus Christ. And he wrote what the Lord declared when he said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I shall be his God, and they shall be my sons. And it's Jesus! Read 1 Timothy 1 and 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Falls right in with oneness theology. Mm -hmm. Acts 3.13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom Ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob makes sense. Because those are three separate people. So it makes perfect sense. That he, but, again, if it had been translated even, would have basically said the same thing. The God of Abraham, even of Isaac, even of Jacob. You see what I'm saying? It still would not have contradicted. We know from the Word of God that the same one that we call Lord is the same one that we call God. There is no Lord but our God. And there is no God but our Lord. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the foundation of the, the Jewish faith, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. 1 Timothy 1 and 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. It's interesting that there's a word missing that would have really made this sound more like two people and would have made it, well, it really wouldn't have changed it if Kai had been translated as even instead of and. But listen, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, even Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Nope, that falls right in with oneness theology. 2 Peter 2.20 For if after they have escaped the pollution of, I, of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now obviously he's not going to say Lord, even Savior, Jesus Christ. But of the Lord and Savior. So it's God the Lord, it's the Father the Lord, and the Savior Jesus Christ. Is the Savior. Do you see how you can start really, if you start nitpicking and you start word playing and pulling at it a little bit, all of a sudden we start seeing separate people everywhere. You can actually make separate people out of passages where separate people is not even meant to be implied. We have the Jehovah's Witnesses telling us and the Mormons telling us that God the Father is this entirely separate entity, an entirely separate thing, and that He is Lord, that He alone is Lord. After all, the, He told the Hebrew people, there's one Lord, that uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, so therefore only the Father can be called Lord. Am I telling the truth? It had to be, because that's what it says. There's one Lord. And yet the Word of God says that God made Jesus both Christ and Lord. 
That's almost done, believe it or not. I'm trying to rush through this today. Titus 1 and 4. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, there's an implication of separation of, of different people. And yet, if that were to read to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, it would not. Hosea 13.4 Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. Listen now. And thou shalt know no God but me. Listen. For there is no Savior beside me. What did we, what did we read a little while ago? What did God say? He said, for my own sake, I do it myself. <laughs> if, if I'm going to take the glory for it, then I'm going to do it myself. Somebody else doesn't do it, and then I take the glory. For that matter, I don't do it and then give my glory to anybody else either, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, the Word of God over and over and over again, I won't read every passage for time, declares Jesus Christ to be both what? Our Lord and Savior. Sure both titles. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Both titles that are reserved for God alone. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Now listen. To close this message today, context matters. I hope you understand. I'm trying to give you some information you need to understand today so that when you're reading the Bible, those of you who've come to an understanding of the oneness of God, if you hit a spot where it looks like the King James translation is trying to apply to people simply because of the word and, just insert the word even and see how it reads then. Okay? Titus 2, 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope <laughs> and the glorious appearing of the, which implies what? Singular. Mm -hmm. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jehovah God declares, I'm up here alone and there is no one beside me. I'm alone. There is no God beside me. He declares, I am your Savior and beside me there is no Savior. And yet here in Titus 2, the writer declares, we are looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. If Jesus is anything less than God, honey, Titus just committed blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Let me finish this passage and my message will be done. Looking for that blessed hope. i got to read it again. Hallelujah. Reminds me of an old song. Think I'll read it again. Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing. Of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us. What? You mean... Jehovah didn't give him for us. No, Jehovah didn't give. He gave himself for us. Listen. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Oh my God. Listen. And purify. And purify unto himself. A peculiar people. Zealous of good works. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the Apostle Paul declared to wit that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself. Unto who? Himself. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Oh my God, have mercy. My God, who is the Spirit, use the, the uh, agent of a human body, which was called the man Jesus Christ, who was called the Son of God after the flesh, so that he who God might reconcile the world unto himself. Hallelujah to God. It wasn't one person reconciling the world unto another person. That's right, amen. So Tommy, Jesus can't be Michael the Archangel. It's not possible. Hallelujah. <laughs> Context matters. Amen. Context matters. Remember that word kai. When you come upon something that kind of causes you pause, or some folks who come from a background, especially Trinitarian background, you read something and, and all of a sudden it, it kind of makes you question. Just look at that word, that one word, and. And just say, now, if that were translated even, how would this read? And see if suddenly it doesn't make perfect sense. Hallelujah. How do you like that?